I want to talk to you tonight about control. It just was started to build. Did you notice that? Is there anyone in the house with control issues? Oh my gosh. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> yes. So everybody repeat after me. Control versus Christ. Control versus Christ. It's a daily choice that we have to make. Last week in our study of Mary and Martha, we read one particular verse, Luke chapter 10, verse 40. It says, Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. It's not control and Christ. It's control or Christ. You need to choose one. She wanted to have both. She wanted Jesus to be Lord, but she wanted to control him. Can you relate? Now, it's not just indigenous to the feminine gender. It's male and female equal opportunity for sticking your foot in it. It's a matter of like Peter, for example, trying to control the Lord. You're not going to the cross, right? It's this opportunity that we have to learn how to trust Christ when we just are so tempted to take control. I felt led to speak to you tonight concerning this topic, specifically as your pastor to women. As I thought about that, I realized, well, all the epistles that speak to women are God speaking through a man to women. So I didn't feel too bad about it. Like this is actually in context and is very biblical. I have a some experience being married, or I should say married for 38 years, but with my wife for 40 years, of just witnessing some of the struggles that my wife has went through being married to a perfect husband such as me. <laughs> I told Pastor Michael, keep the tomatoes away from the front door when the women are coming in today. A verse that you're well familiar with in Genesis referring to the fall of mankind, the curse. The scripture says that he said to the woman, the Lord, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. I know your favorite verse from Genesis to Revelation, right? Now, here's some good news before we get into some of the challenges, all right? When God created mankind, and I say mankind, don't you understand, my sisters? A man does not represent the Lord, the image of the Lord. It's the man and the woman together that represent the image of God. The scripture was, he made male and female, man and woman, ish and isha. It's like two equal parts of one whole. The fall separated that. Where no longer could a man by himself, because uh, he wasn't one with his wife, represent the image of God. The good news is, when Christ redeemed mankind, he brought the two back together. He brought the two back together from creation to creator, and he brought the two back from Jew and Gentile, and he brought the two back with husband and wife that could really be one and bear his image. That's why in Galatians 3, you read that in Christ there is neither slave nor free, Greek, Hebrew, Jew, male, female, because we're one in Christ Jesus. So the good news is, for brothers and sisters, that when we're in Jesus, we've been redeemed from the curse, amen? Amen. So we've been redeemed positionally, but we still have this battle we go through, even though we have this nature that is divine and one with God, we have a tendency to want to go back to the old man, the old woman, the old fallen nature. And part of that is wanting control. And how we learn to trust God is when we're in environments where we really feel that we're right and we need to take control. Are you ready? In Jesus' name. 
because the Lord has showed us and he just doesn't get it. He's a little slow. I'm praying and fasting for him. The Lord showed me he's supposed to be my husband, but he's just not getting it. Or he is my husband, and he's slow, and he's not getting it, and I'm... Mm -mm -mm. It's a real epidemic in the body of Christ because the truth of it is there's a lot more women seeking the face of God than there are men in the body of Christ. That's been the case since the cross of Calvary because there's just a greater sensitivity. And so it's hard for the sisters that go... I'm sensing the Holy Spirit saying this, and I'm sensing that we have a deeper need for just reverence for God in our home and our lives, but my husband's not getting it, and I'm praying for him. So when is a wife being inspiring, and when is she being manipulative? It's tough, I bet. Like I said, I've been with Kathy for 40 years, and I've watched her. This is my city gate moment. I've watched you put up with me well. Thank you. <laughs> well, and trust the Lord because many times I have found in my marriage that the Lord is speaking to Kathy things that he's trying to say to me, but I've been stubborn. For example, my wife said to me when we were first got married, honey, I think you're called to be a pastor. And I said, you're way off. <laughs> a little slow. But the thing is, what do you do as a woman when your husband's a little slow spiritually? How do you trust God in that situation? How do you walk that line? Well, the apostle Peter, who was a married man, he had some counsel for women, just like you. And if you're here tonight, you're going, Dave, you're missing the mark because I'm single, then you really need to listen up. Because what you don't wanna do is make the mistake that so many women do is they seek out a man they can fix. I'm letting you know it won't work. They see some of you here, you're married, and you go, that was me, and you're right, it hasn't. Well, the good news is God has you in an environment to learn how to trust him, to learn how to draw near to him. Here's the bottom line, are you ready? The issue is not so much the event that you think needs to have a justice applied to it as much as it is you learning to trust God and find out this one amazing thing, that the love of God is sufficient for you. That the leadership of the Holy Spirit is sufficient for you. You don't need your husband to become an Apostle Paul for you to be fulfilled. You have Jesus. You don't need him to get a gift of prophecy to make sure your life goes the right way. You have the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? The answer is no, you don't. The honest answer is you're learning, just like we all are. You're in process. But that's like someone saying, I want to work out and get some muscular tone on my body, but I don't want any pain with it. Doesn't work like that. To learn how to trust the Lord with all of your heart means that God might have, or let's just say, because we believe in the sovereignty of God, did arrange the situation you're in. Now, you might want to look at it with your own understanding, but we know that's not trust in the Lord, is it? You got to see the big picture, and the big picture is called trust, that God, you never sleep, you never slumber. All of this is part of your plan. Even what looks like tragedy is meant to break down my will to trust yours without understanding, and I find marriage, oh my gosh, is an incredible opportunity to do just that. The apostle Peter is writing to the church and he says in chapter three, verse one, in the same way you must, your wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Now I want you to take note, students of the Bible, when you read in the same way, you wanna go, well, what does that mean in the same way what? You always wanna read the text in its context, right? So looking back to the verse right before it, because when the Bible was written, there were no chapters and verses. So the context would be, looking at the past verse, verse 25 of chapter two, that you were like street sheep going astray, but have now returned the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In other words, he's saying in the same way that we've all gone astray and just submitted ourselves to the shepherd and trusting him, Paul, Peter is saying, wives, in the same way, trust God by submitting to your husband. Now, that's a tough one, is it not? 
learning to trust God, because let's face it, a lot of times her husband is way off. Now, could God lead your husband to be way off just to see whether you would trust him? God works like that. He works like that. Because he brings us to situations where we're going, but this is not right, and I know it's not right because I got a verse telling me so. That would be like Jesus, the shepherd of our souls. It would be like him standing before the Sanhedrin and going, this is unjust, and this is not right, and I'm calling down a legion of angels to stop this right now. But instead, he was silent and entrusted himself to him who judges justly because he saw beyond the unjust moment and he trusted the Father to bring about the perfect will of the Father. He trusted the Holy Spirit, not what he could do. That's powerful. In the same way, sisters, God is calling you to trust not even your husband, but to trust the Lord. And I know there's times you look back and you go, there's times I've done that and there's times that I fail. Don't be discouraged. That's part of the process. God, I think that God gives marriage really to teach us that once again, his love is sufficient for us and his leadership is sufficient for us because our spouse's love and leadership will always inevitably disappoint us. Matter of fact, it's at those moments I'm convinced that the Lord is looking to say, do you trust me? The next verse in well, the following verse, I should say, it says, I'll just read it from the beginning here. In the same way, your, your wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even some who refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without words. They will be won over. You're saying, I'm still waiting on that part, right? <laughs> they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. In the same way Jesus is going, what's going to bring the Father's will to pass is not me calling down a thousand angels. It's me trusting in him who can't be seen, the Holy Spirit, to bring about the righteous will of God and justice for the moment. See, Jesus was able to do that because he had this incredible relationship with the Father. Peter is saying, sisters, in the same way that we trust our good shepherd, in the same way the shepherd trusted the Father, I want you to trust the Father when you've got husbands who aren't listening to the gospel. Now, see, what happens is we have a tendency to think sometimes God needs our help. Mm. You know what? When is God using us to speak to our husband, and when are we just being manipulative? Have you ever asked that question? When am I supposed to just be silent and trust the Lord? And when am I supposed to say something, or maybe on the reverse side of it, when is me being silent, being passive, and enabling injustice in a way that's not pleasing the Lord? For example, Esther, she was someone, aren't you glad she spoke? So how do you know the difference? Man, it comes down to whether you're a man or a woman saying, Lord, I'm spending so much time in your presence that fulfillment of my life and peace in my future is found only at the feet of Jesus. We looked at Mary last week who was single. Her brother had died. Things had went really south. But she had learned through it all just to say, Jesus, you're my husband. I mean, some of you gals in here are single, and, and, and I would imagine... Being single and being in your 30s can be discouraging because you start to go, will I ever get a husband? Is something wrong with me? When you can come to a place and say, Jesus, when you want me to have a husband, I'll have one. I don't need to change. I don't need to go get a degree. I don't need to go to the gym eight days a week. I don't need to do this or do that. I need to be myself and what you've called me to be and find all my fulfillment and direction in you. And when you want to teach me more how to trust you, which is what marriage will really do, then you'll give me a man. You know what that's called? Worship. Trust. Or when a woman's going, 
that's what I did. And then the man that I got, sometimes I look back and think I was happier before I got the man I thought I needed. And the thing is, that could be God's man that he gave you. That doesn't mean you're not going to have those moments. Matter of fact, it's almost weird to think you've never had those moments, right? Because if God is going to use a spouse to push your buttons of idolatry, mm, yeah, we're going there, then clearly that's going to be uncomfortable and, and you're going to resent it and get pushed back to the Lord. It's like Mary. Mary did not like what was going on. She didn't like the environment that the Lord was providing for her because it was exposing some control issues that Mary had, right? Man, you want to talk about how to con expose control issues? Get married. I mean, that whole thing about the two cease to be two and they become one, that's for real. <laughs> but but the, the reality of the death that took place at the I do, it's like an echo in the mountains, Die, 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 die. It just goes on for months and years. It, it just does. And, and, and sometimes it's like slams you in the head and you're like, oh my gosh, can I just be alone? Can I just go eat where I want to eat? Can I just watch what I want to watch? Can I just buy what I want to buy? And why do I have to ask him? I make the money too. Why is he in charge? Hmm. And your desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Ouch. This is the Lord's way of drawing you to dependency upon him. This is not a punishment. This is not a lingering of the curse in Genesis chapter 3. Because if you are redeemed, daughter of the Most High God, you have been removed from the curse in Jesus' name. So you go, well, then, then why the whole thing with the submission? Well, submission's not a bad word. It's wonderful. Jesus submitted to the Father. The Holy Spirit submits to only say, repeat what the words of Christ were. There's an order that glorifies God. And here on earth, there is an order for husbands and wives that glorifies the Lord. The thing is, the enemy wants to come in, and he's always wanting to pervert the order of God. And he perverts it as the pendulum swings, as I referenced earlier, where you can have a wife who's going, okay, I'm not submitting. I am woman. Hear me roar. Right? Women's lib for Jesus. And matter of fact, Galatians 3, you quoted a pastor, there's neither male nor female in Christ. See, that's obsolete now. No. That's the enemy trying to rob you and you succumb to your fear and take control, right? And you can't trust God while you're taking control. They don't work together. It's like hating and loving at the same time. So when God gives you opportunity to submit and release the illusion of control, he's actually saying, I want to bring you closer to myself, my daughter, and show you how my love is sufficient for you and how my leadership is sufficient and supernatural in the midst of what looks like a car accident. I'm going to create something beautiful if you'll trust me. If you'll trust me with your heart and not justify your words and your actions when they're just really a cover-up for something very worldly and very primal in your sinful nature. It's very challenging. Martha tried this dichotomy of I worship the Lord, I trust the Lord, but I want to control the Lord. Tonight, you've got the opportunity to hear some things that might expose this ungodly, demonic dichotomy and you're thinking of what it means to be submissive. Now, I want to clarify before we move any further, to be submissive doesn't mean to not have a voice. Did you hear that? Don't ever go from one extreme to being thinking, man, I've just got to be controlling. I've got to be manipulative. I've got to lead my husband because he's not leading. Don't counterbalance to go, well, I'm just going to be submissive, so zip, I don't have a voice. Both of them are abusive and unhealthy and don't represent the design for which God created you. Do you hear that? Now, the fine line, it's, it's tough to find and it's a unique fingerprint for every man and woman within a relationship that you have to seek God and find. I mean, Peter is writing to particularly women who've got husbands who are just a little slow on the uptake in the things of the spirit and how they deal with it. 
But he says something very powerful here. How says you can win them over without words. That Again, that doesn't mean you don't have a voice. It's a matter of saying that your trust is not in your words to win them over. There's a difference. In other words, you can come to your husband and share, this is what I prayed about. This is what I'm sensing from the Lord. But if your motivation is to win him over and change him, you are operating in a spirit of manipulation. Do you understand? Now, if a matter if you're coming and saying, I'm just being true to my good shepherd, but I'm gonna trust that once I share what I'm thinking and what I believe is the Lord, I'm gonna honor my husband even if he's not saved. Don't fall into the trap to go, yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor. I'm born again. He doesn't have the Spirit of God. Irrelevant. He's your husband. God brought him in your life. Matter of fact, God might be using your reverent life and honoring to God to win over his heart to Jesus. Do you know how many times I've seen that? I could sit here all night telling you stories of how I've seen this verse come alive. But I've also witnessed the difficulty and the heartbreak and the crushing of a sister trusting the Lord, not in their words. Again, not counterbalancing to say I'm a doormat, I don't have a voice, I don't matter. No, 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 don't fall into that lie. That's just a form of abuse that you can throw Bible verses at that are out of context. It's a matter of saying my approval, my fulfillment's found in the Lord. I have a place and a responsibility like Esther to come and speak what God has put on my heart. But even if I'm right and that's the will of the Lord and it's biblical and he goes the other direction, that doesn't mean that's not his will. It could be a matter of that you come and you share, and I've seen this many times, sisters. Some of you could give testimonies to this, where you come and share something with your husband and it really is biblical, it's full of love, it's full of truth, it's sound, and he doesn't listen, he goes the other way. After so many times, how many times will it take for him to go, hmm, maybe I should listen to my wife? Do you know what will make the difference? When that crossroad comes, do you trust Christ or do you try and take control? Now, you're going to say, some of you are going to go, well, I trust Christ because I was quiet. I shared. I didn't share anything. It's a fine line between submission and toleration. See, submitting is a heart posture, not a worship to your husband, but to God that I trust, like Jesus before the St. Hadrian, I trust the Father. It's not in Caiaphas, the high priest, this guy in holy garb and all he's wearing. It's the Father. Same with you, my sister. You're going, hey, if he goes that direction, that might be God moving him. You're going, that can't happen. He's not saved. God moves Pharaoh. <laughs> God can move anybody. God might be moving your, heart, your husband's heart towards a train wreck. And then he, and, and now that's how God humbles us. Because I'll, I'll speak for the men. We can be some stubborn folk. <laughs> right? So what if God is motivating that man to go down in that direction? And then as he's sitting there in the train wreck, he's thinking about you in this gentle, quiet spirit. Firmness, conviction, courage, humility. And even though she disagreed, she supported you like it was her idea. Let me tell you what, a man can only experience that so many times before God humbles him. It's the way God crushes a man. But a woman has to be willing. She can't give way to fear, you see. Now, the epitome, the end of someone giving in to control, we see Martha controlling. And I'd think if we took a census in this room, there could probably be a lot of ladies that would tell some stories of how you spiritualized and Christianized and slapped a dove on some actions that you called loving, but it was really, if you're honest, control based in fear, right? Be honest, okay? It's, it starts like that. It's kind of like someone doesn't get pneumonia and they're on the, the, the edge of death in a heartbeat. It started off with a little cough. Just some little bacterial infection, something that's a good place, right? How, what happens when a woman says, I'm going, in the name of Jesus, I'm gonna worship God, but I'm gonna take control. The enemy has a plan to corrupt you and your family when you give in to this. Instead of trusting God, 
the depth of an example would be in the Bible, a woman named Jezebel. Now you've heard, well, how many, I'm not, I'm not gonna ask that question. Um, <laughs> I'll say it this way. I'm sure there are many women in this room that you've had either a husband or someone say to you, you got the spirit of Jezebel about you. I talked to so many counselors the, and have counsel where I've heard men say that to their wife and they stereotype them because they've got control issues that somehow they have, have the same demonic principality that Jezebel did, who had, was married to Ahab. I want to tell you personally, I think that's garbage. There's nothing biblical about it. There's nothing solid theologically to go, the same demonic principality that had her is tapping on you and it's, no. But there are types in other words, you can see there is definitely a principality behind this queen of Israel who her and Ahab, boy, were they a petri dish for codependence. And I mean in a wicked way because Ahab was someone who just, he had no spine. He was your guy that just sit there drinking beer and eating pizza and hitting the remote control. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Talk to your mother. He just had no spine. But, but see, Someone whose Jezebel has control issues has a tendency to go, that's the kind of guy I want. And I see that in some marriages where you'll have a woman, not, not as far removed like as Ahab and Jezebel, but a woman who loves the Lord, but she's a tip of the spear type man. She's just got that zeal and that charisma. She walks prophetically and she doesn't want to lose her freedom or her control. So she finds a guy who's passive and Ahab-ish. I've witnessed it so many times. And I've seen marriages where the people marry for 20 years and, and it's covered over in spirituality, but it's not honoring and it's out of order, you see. Jezebel, again, is the epitome of the end, end of the road of where Satan wants to bring women who just taste a little bit of I want control versus I'm going to trust that God is in control. And he works all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. My trust is as my husbandman, Jesus, right? But when you start going down that road where you want to play Holy Spirit, it's a dangerous road to go down. See, King Ahab, who had his roots in the tribe of Judah, but some roots in Arab nations as well, he took on the Sidonian princess named Jezebel, which the name means exalted by Baal. So he married this woman who brought all kinds of idols into the house of God. And, and she, she treated Ahab, Ahab would whine like a little baby, and she would come along, oh, come here, come here, Abe, come on, I'll, I'll fix this for you. You want this piece of property? Well, I'll, I'll kill the guy, I'll get him for you. Just, and she seduced him on multiple levels, emotionally, sexually, mentally, spiritually, but it was all demonic through her and, and, and basically moving through her, these demon spirits actually moved into Ahab where he was the most wicked king in all of Israel's history. And it came through this woman that was controlling. It's incredible. Now, what I wanna read to you is this passage. This is what takes place um, at her death. I like to read the end of stories. Ahab had already died, just so you know. Mr. Spineless, he had died in battle from a fatal wound. And so Jehu, who was basically a military general in Ahab's army, after Ahab had died, he's ready to take out Jezebel and all of Ahab's kids, and he's ready to clean house, meaning temples out of God's house. And he's starting with Jezebel. This is intense. Look at this, 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30. It said, when Jezebel, the queen mother, heard that Jehu had come to Jezreel, she, pointed, she painted her eyelids and fixed her hair and sat at a window. Now, just stop there really quick. I want to point out that when there's control issues that move into the demonic realm, you can always recognize when a woman is trying to control the situation and using her femininity. Seduction. Now you might think, well, I don't have that issue, I'm married. Just back up for a second. Don't think that the enemy can't move through you to be controlling 
and get what you want through your husband through seduction, through wearing something a little special, by doing something you know he likes that really you shouldn't be doing. That is demonic. Now, how did it get there? Just a little bit of a cough turns into a heavy cough to an infection. Demons get involved. Just because you're controlling doesn't mean you have something demonic in your life, to be clear. I'm letting you know where the enemy wants to take you, my sister, when you drink in this spirit of control and you take it to a degree of you're trying to run life and run your husband and run those around you, know that there's spiritual warfare going on. And whenever I see women trying to dress and appease and find acceptance in the way that they dress and the way that they act and using the seductive spirit, I go, Satan, get behind me. That's something I want to encourage you to be careful. Specifically, I'll say this to my, to my sisters who are single in this room. I know so often, many of you, it's hard to live in a world where you just see there's so much competition where women are dressing, walking, acting a certain way, and they get attention. And many churches, you walk in today, there's women dressing like they're coming to a meat market or a singles club. And what you're doing is you're saying, well, God's given me curves. I'm just being myself. Man, be cautious with that. Be cautious with that. Be, be a godly woman. That I don't need to draw attention from a man to myself based on my body, based on my makeup and how I look and what kind of hair do I, this is Jezebel. Oh, I got Jehu coming and I know he's, he's a murderer. I know he's out to get me. I've got wind of this. Let me fix myself up and see if I can seduce him. The enemy wants to have a woman seek for control using something that God gave just for your husband, just to glorify him. The enemy wants you to have you use that to use control for you. This is what I see here with Jezebel, something to, to make note of that we will see addressed as we come back to 1 Peter 3. It says, when Jehu entered the gate of the palace, she shouted to him, have you come in peace, you murderer? You're just like Zimni, who murdered his master. And Jehu looked up and saw her at the window and shouted, who is on my side? And two or three, now two or three is usually referring to a governmental position of judgment in the courtroom. Two or three witnesses, for example. It says here, this is powerful. It says, and two or three eunuchs looked at him. Now, why were there eunuchs there? Because Jezebel was notorious for taking men and castrating them. See, that's ultimately... When a woman dives into the realm of control instead of trusting God, what Satan is trying to do is kind of like what you see today, calling men women and women men and confusing gender and roles. Satan wants to pervert and distort and destroy God's order. Women that are walking in control, that's what you're doing. I want you to think about this. When you're manipulating your man, you're nagging him, you're playing Holy Spirit, you are turning him into a eunuch. It's Jezebel-like when that happens. Now, in your mind, you're going, no, I'm just trying to help him get it. No, you're playing Holy Spirit. You're playing Holy Spirit. And you're succumbing to the fallen primary nature that is sinful to be in control. And you're, here's the, the saddest part of it. You're messing the opportunity to learn that God's love for you is sufficient. You're messing the opportunity to say, God, you're bigger than this problem. You're bigger than the stubbornness and rebelliousness of this man. You're bigger. And I can trust that through me trusting you, this could win this man's heart over to you, which that's what really needs to happen, right? But you see the contrast of what happens with a woman who drinks the deep demonic Kool-Aid of control. It's emasculating to men. The irony is the very thing the sister you're wanting to have a man who loves the Lord his God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength and will lead in the spirit, you're actually spiritually castrating him because you can't be patient to wait for the Holy Spirit to birth something in him. You say, but I have been waiting not long enough. Clearly, God has some work to teach you about trusting his process. Jesus, the overseer of your soul, 
He was the prototype. He showed you how to trust the Father in the midst of injustice, didn't he? He showed us all. We see the outcome. Two or three eunuchs at them. And Jehu said, throw her down, Jehu yelled. So they threw her out of the window, and her blood spattered against the wall on the horses. And Jehu trampled her body under his horse's hooves. Great passage for a women's series, right? So... <laughs> But I can't tell you. Then Jehu went up into the palace and ate and drank. <laughs> Afterward, he said, somebody go out and bury this cursed woman, for she is the daughter of a king, pagan king. But when they went out to bury her, they found only her skull, her feet, and her hands. When they returned and told Jehu, he stated, this fulfills the message from the Lord, which he spoke through his servant Elijah and Tishbe at the plot of the land in Jezreel. Dogs will eat Jezebel's body. Her remains will be scattered like dung on the plot of land in Jezreel so that no one will be able to recognize her. Wow. The, here's this woman of such influence, beauty, power, Position, and it all came to nothing but a dunghill. That's powerful. Is that inspiring to not want to be controlling? Like, I want to be the opposite of that, right, sister? I be. I want to trust God. I don't want to sit there and control. I want to. I don't want to invert God's order in any way. I want to trust God. This woman named Jezebel has, is an infamous name. It was actually used in the book of Revelation when Jesus was writing to the church of Thyatira. Different Jezebel, obviously, but interesting. As Jesus gave praise to the church, he says, nevertheless, verse 20, I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. See, that's one of the problems in the church of Jesus Christ is when there are sisters that get caught up beyond the primary sinful nature of control into something demonic, that churches tolerate this behavior. I've seen it many times throughout the decades of walking with Jesus, where I've seen gifted women come in, and they come in, they get involved in church, they get involved in a platform, and every time they always have an Ahab as a husband, every time one that does not have any type of leadership, no position, no boldness, no authority in his life, doesn't lay down his life for his wife, just follows his wife. That's all he does. And the woman works herself into the church. She creates a platform and a position. And initially, it looks like, wow, this is great. This sister's on fire for Jesus. And then after a while, she starts to invite women over to her house for a Bible study. Something different other than the church is doing. It starts to promote other theology, other books, other authors, and then all of a sudden she starts to get addressed. And then all of a sudden, at that point, she plays the victim. The church is controlling. The church is abusive. And she draws people to herself. And it's a lose-lose for leadership with a Jezebel because she's manipulating, drawing people after idols and false doctrine, teaching false things, but then when she's addressed from male authority, then it's misogynistic abusive behavior. I've seen churches close down with this dynamic so many times. And it's always placating on the preposition that, hey, you know what? Women are just overseen in the church. And to a degree, that's true. The pendulum swings. But this Jezebel spirit-like individual, this is how they play this card. And I'm telling you, I've seen this played out so many times in churches I've pastored over the years it always starts off with this zeal, this charisma, this knowledge of the word, but unwilling to release control and unwilling to acknowledge covering and authority in their lives. That was Jezebel. This is what Jesus is addressing there in the church in Thyatira. It says, her teaching, she misleads my service into sexual immorality and eating things, food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children dead, those who are following her. 
And then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and will repay each of you according to your deeds. Oh my gosh, what a passage. Do you see how the enemy comes in to try and not only destroy marriages, but churches with sisters who are spiritually gifted, but they come in looking for control and manipulate. I'd like to say that I've never seen this at Reveal Fellowship, but I have. I've seen all too often where sisters are gifted and given a platform, but all of a sudden, because they're trying to find love and platform and recognition from men, all of a sudden, something demonic gets involved. And then you have the pendulum swinging counterbalance where women are seen as second citizens in the church as a way to respond to this. You follow me? And you see this in churches where there are actually churches where women are not permitted to speak. They must be silent. Where you take that First Timothy 2 passage and it's ripped out of a context completely and turns women into a second citizen. as something less than a man. So that's Satan's plan is to get the body of Christ, the body off its equilibrium of what male and female are supposed to be. And this is what demons do. The scripture is telling us to be wise and be such discerning and know our function in the body of Christ. Because when we know our function, we're gonna learn how to trust him. I mean, ultimately, sister, if you've got a husband who is just driving you crazy and you're feeling held back by, you need to give God glory and say, Lord, you have me in this situation that my understanding tells me I'd be happier either without him or I've got to fix him or I'm going to lose my mind. God has a better plan. And right what you're at that moment where you're so tempted to use your mouth to change him. We're going to use your hair to change him. You're going to be sweet to somehow appease him and change him. Don't fall prey to that. Be true to the Lord, amen? Be true to what God has called you to be, and you'll be at peace and fulfilled, check this out, regardless of what your husband does. You don't need him to do or not do anything in order for you to have your best life in this world following Jesus. I mean, anything else would be a form of idolatry. Can you imagine God saying, well, I'm sorry, my daughter, you can't be happy unless your husband submits to me. How cruel would that be? But somehow, my sisters, you get in your mind to think, you just can't have that gold medal life with Jesus unless your husband gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, maybe it's you accepting that you can have the hundredfold blessing simply because his grace is sufficient for you. And when you believe that as you're trusting in the Lord, you're gonna have a perfect peace. I don't hear any amens. Come on, right? I mean, this is the truth, right? Listen to what else that the, Paul, the Apostle Peter says. He says in verse three, don't be concerned about the outward beauty and fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry and beautiful clothes. In other words, he says, sisters, you're gonna have a tendency to wanna find your identity and the way you can control the way you look and what other people think about how you look. Don't fall prey to that because that's the entry level to walking into that spirit of control. It, it, it doesn't mean a woman can't wear a nice dress or she can't do her hair right. It, it, it's, it's a matter of, is that what you're putting your faith in? You see the difference? And it's a hard thing. No one can look at you and go, unless, of course, you're wearing something completely inappropriate, right? That's one of those topics that I feel like, like uh, I'm, I'm chumming the water even bringing this up about the way a woman dresses because it's, it's like one of those things like in the Bible, like there's no clear lines, Right? Because I know some of you sisters, you're like, it's the way some women dress in, in church, it's like, it's just wrong, right? Yeah, yeah see? Uh, thank you. One person said that. <laughs> you know, but, and then there's other sisters who are like, you got no right to be talking about this. I, listen, my concern is your soul, okay? It's your soul. And when I see women coming to church and and. They're basically not, there's no sensitivity at all in what you're wearing and how maybe a man would perceive that. In your conscious mind, you might very well be going, I'm not even thinking about it, okay? Fair enough. But you should be. You should be. If you really love the brothers in Jesus, you should be going, how would a man 
would he be stumbled by this? Do you think that's a loving thing? Now, see, some women go, hey, I got freedom to dress however I want. Well, yeah, you do. There are women that have freedom to go in a strip bar and work. That doesn't make it right. I can tell you, my sisters, there are men that come to church that are wrestling with the lust of the eye and how wonderful would it be if they came to a 1 Peter 3 church that where they walk in and women, they dress with modesty and they're godly and, and, and they're conscious of like, from behind, how do these pants look? Don't look with the eye of you thinking, well, I think I look nice. What does Jesus think? Do you really pray and go, Jesus, your sons who are wrestling with a porn addiction and they're coming here to worship, what are they seeing? Now see, for you, like a tight shirt with a bra strap showing, you might go, dude, it's a bra strap, big deal. Wrong way to think. Now see, some churches, they go so far as women can't wear pants and every woman wears a potato sack. And I've been to churches where it's like, that's what I mean. There's no clear scripture. Well, where should the skirt be? Is this here? Should it be below the knee? We're not going there here at Reveal Fellowship. We're not gonna start dictating things like that. What I'm gonna say is, where is your heart? You know, the Apostle Paul, he talked about the topic of meat sacrificed to idols in 1 Corinthians because there were some people that were stumbled by it. He's like, you know what? I'm not stumbled by a piece of steak that was sacrificed to an idol but that went to a meat market and I'm gonna eat it. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. But if it stumbles you, I'll never eat meat again. I'll give up my freedom because I care about what might stumble you. Can you imagine women in the church going, I'm so conscious of pleasing God and not stumbling brothers that I'm gonna be conscious and dress with modesty and dress godly. Can you imagine that? Instead of the church looking like a nightclub half the time. It comes down to a woman to recognize and going, man, I never thought about this, but maybe when I accentuate the God-given curves that God's given to me that he made for my husband, when I accentuate those, am I trying to feed a need to be loved and be led and to be recognized? Could it be? I'm gonna answer the question, yes. Many times that's what's happening. But you have to mean that prayer you're praying in the morning when you say, search my heart, God. Test my thoughts. Look at the way I'm dressed. Is it pleasing to you? Is it honoring to you? Because I care about pleasing your heart and I love your sons and would never want to stumble them. Men should be doing the same thing, sisters. Believe me, I talk to them. Some guys, the way they dress, it's it's inappropriate. What are you trying to do? Get for a GQ magazine and tight shirt to show your pecs and and guys wearing shorts up here where their thighs should pop it out. Like, what are you doing? I mean, I've seen guys dressing with really tight shorts and I've witnessed women kind of checking them out. I'm like, in the house of God. (laughs) Seriously, it's not okay. It's not okay, it's not pure, it's not honoring to the Lord. And and the sad thing is, it's a form of idolatry because you're saying, I care more about the recognition of creation than the creator. Don't be concerned about beauty outward, hairstyles, expensive jewelry and beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God, hallelujah. And they accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband. You know the one that told her to lie? That one? Abraham Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. Now, I'm not counseling you, sisters, to go home to hubby and say, hello, master. I'm not saying that. Again, it's a heart posture. It's just saying, hey, I'm trusting in God. I'm coming under authority. I'm not going to be passive to the point I don't have a voice and think I'm less than my husband. That's going the wrong direction the other way, right? Ultimately, Christ is your master. Christ. Christ and Christ alone. You're one with Christ. And the more that you know that, the less threatening, less hard there is to be a Sarah. It says, you are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. 
wow. Man, that's a hard pill to swallow. I know because in your mind you're going, I tried that, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, it didn't work, and he walked all over me. And then you rose up. Now, there's the exception to the rule. I'm not here to enable abuse. There are men that are emotionally, mentally, and phys even physically abusive. God has not called you to submit to that, to be clear. And then there's some in the room. There might be one person in this room that's dealing with that. Just for that one person, I'll say that. And if you're concerned that's what it is, but you're going, I'm not sure whether this is abuse or whether it's a trial I need to trust God in, it's very hard for you to be objective within your own trial. Get some help if you're concerned about that. You with me? That's really important. But I've usually found that's not the case. It's more God teaching you to trust. And you're in this battle of, am I, do I try, am I trusting Christ or am I being controlling? And I'm gonna tell you and leave you with this one thought that will help you to discern whether you're being controlling or trusting in Christ. You have a nature, you have two. You have the divine nature, but you've got this old primary nature that's sinful that God told Eve about in the garden, right? What will make the difference is doing what Jehu did after Jezebel was cast down. He went into the temple of God and he removed the idols. Usually what we idolize, we control. In other words, for example, if you care more about your husband's lifestyle and value the change in his life to bring you fulfillment, you've made him an idol. You gotta repent of that. If you're so worried about your kids that you're stressed out and you have no peace and you're screaming at them because deep inside you're really feeling like they're a reflection of your own failure, their obedience is your idol. Your job. I, I, I put more into my job than I do my marriage or my kids. It's an idol. You're trying to control the narrative of how you reflect it versus his grace is sufficient. You can't do anything more or do anything less to change his acceptance and love for you. Whether it's a job, a spouse, kids, it could be, man, it's my body. I, I'm just, I, I do so much with diet and exercise, so much because I got to do this so I can feel accepted. Then your body is an idol. Do you follow where I'm going with all this? It's like if you don't cast down the idols, you won't have the discernment to know, am I being controlling by saying something? Or am I following Christ by saying something? And if I engage in this situation where there's disagreement, how will I know how I follow the Spirit? If you take stock of any idols in your life and you cast them down, the Holy Spirit will speak to you clearly. And when God brings you to that crossroad to trust Christ and release, not tolerate, but submit with a heart that is a witness of his glory to your husband, if you don't have any idols in your life, my sister, you will pass the test. You won't be a Martha that's serving and busy and concerned and then trying to manipulate God and people around you. Instead, you'll be a Mary. Do you know you can be a Mary and a Martha at the same time? You can be busy for the kingdom, busy as a wife, busy as, as a mom, busy as a servant of the Lord and have total peace and be a Mary and totally trusting Christ versus being controlling and judging people and gossiping about people. You can do that if you're taking daily stock of idols in your life. And when the Holy Spirit points this out to you, if you're quick to repent, I mean, you should be calling us down every morning, sisters. Just any type of anything that you're holding on to that's in the way, call it down. Confess it. You might have to go, Lord, forgive me for caring more about what my husband thinks about me than what you've told me about me. Forgive me, Lord, for letting my kid's disobedience steal my joy when you're my joy, Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the way 1 John closes out the epistle. The New Living Translation puts it like this, and I'll leave you with these words. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Anything, including things he gives you such as a spouse, such as kids, such as a career. Never 
place your identity in any of those people or those things, because if you do, you'll be choosing control over Christ. But when you say, Jesus, your love is sufficient, Holy Spirit, your leadership is sufficient, I'm complete in you and you alone, you'll glorify God. In Jesus' name.